Okay, hello everyone. Um, we're about to start uh, the first uh, session of, for today. Uh, it will be um, the, the, the quiz session. Uh, it's uh, going to be the answers to the quiz uh, that you had uh, a few days ago. Uh, will be done by Dr. Rauda. So on to you, Dr. Rauda, to start the first question. So good evening and good afternoon to everybody um, and welcome to our seven DEP uh, meeting. So first we will start with the quiz answering uh, session and thank to everybody who answered the quiz and uh, well done, you get a really good marks. Um, and first of all, we want to congratulate Dr. Aosh al Musa. she got the highest mark of the quiz. So congratulations Dr. Aosh and well done. So let's review the quiz. So I think it was a little bit difficult this time. <laughs> Not everybody got the right answer. Okay, okay. So the first question is, um, you have a hypertrophic epithelium of the mature psoriasis plaque. It's associated with an increased ex expression of which keratin? Keratin one or 10, five and 14, six and 16, 17 or 2e. We can either shout the answer or type them on the chat box. Um, no matter if it is right or wrong, we'll just then discuss each question. So we have, have we go, well done, yes, it's answer C, it's keratin 6 and 16. And as you know that keratin 6 and 16 is upregulated in the psoriasis plaque. So let's have a quick just reminder, just keep your mic muted if you don't mind, so we'll not disturb anybody. Okay, so question one and 10 is, do anybody know where it can be present? Which is this? Here we go, Dr. Michel. Yes, it's an epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, okay? Keratin 4 and 5 and 14. This is very important. 5 and 14. Yes, Dr. Michel, it's an epidermolysis bullosa simplex. Keratin 17. Okay, it can be seen in psoriasis, it can be seen in prolygonadularis, it can be seen in malignancy. Um, like a breast cancer, okay? Keratin 2E, this is very important. So where can you see keratin 2E? Yes, Dr. Michel, ichthyosis bullosa of semen, this is very important, this is very important, okay. Have we go to the second question, which Extracutaneous organ is typically associated with this subtype of sarcoidosis. No answer to go. Any other choices? Your mic muted, please. 
or somebody who opened the mic. Thank you. Okay, yes, we get two answer of the lung. Yes, and do you know which type of sarcoidosis does it called? The one that usually involves the nose. Answer, which type of sarcoidosis? Yes, Dr. Jawahar. Yes, Dr. Jawahar and Dr. Mishal. Well done. Um, lupus pernu, which is often associated with a chronic sarcoidosis of the lung, and usually it do involve many organs, but mainly is the pulmonary sarcoidosis. Okay. Third question, what is the classical radiological finding associated with sturge Weber syndrome? Dual calcification, calcification of lax cerebri, tram tract calcification, osteopathia striata, osteopocleosis. Yes, and we get a three, four, okay, yes, it's C, tram tract calcification of the temporal and occipital um, area. And as you can see here, um, as you can see here, it's a sporadic. Do you know that you know that Sturge Weber syndrome is sporadic disease, um, and it is characterized by the very classical when you see the patient the facial capillary malformation and mainly the trigeminal nerve distribution, and you do have other other presentation with the cerebral atrophy, with the um, with the seizure, with the glaucoma. But the classical presentation is the tram track calcification of the temporal and the occipital. <laughs> uh, can you just keep your mic muted, please? Okay, I, I'll keep it myself. Can you just keep your mic muted, please? Of course, I cannot mute the test iPhone. <laughs> iPhone, can you keep your mic muted? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, um, anybody know that there? These are very classical presentation of the radiological presentation of some of the disease. The dual calcification. Where can you see the dual calcification? Dural, sorry, the dural calcification. Very important um, radiological finding in which disease? You have to refresh your memory. Dr. Emmy, um, no. It's Papillon liver syndrome. Do you have to remember this, okay? The calcification of the flax cerebri is seen in which syndrome? Yes, it's Corlene syndrome, Dr. Michelle, yes. Osteopathia striata? Yes, it's in Gold syndrome. Osteo osteopocleosis, seen in which syndrome? Yes, it's in Pushka olendorf syndrome. Well done, well done all. Okay, question four. Eosinophils are activated by which interleukin? More answer to go, any other? Yes, well done, it's interleukin-5, yes. And as you know that interleukin-1 is mainly for the host innate inflammatory response, the two for the T cell, the three for the mass growth and the passophile, the fourth for the increase um, T helper two responses, okay, uh, but five is mainly for eosinophil, very important, okay. Question five, which of the following is a part of the alternative component cascade system? And I think most of you get this question wrong. You have any other suggestion? Yes, okay. So we get two answer of C. And yes, it is C, it's C3, actually, it's all of them are the classical component of the pathway, but particularly as you see in the diagram, C3 is a part of the alternative component system. You can see the C3 
uh, but even C3 to present on the classical as well. Okay, but C3 is mainly on the alternative pathway. Okay, that is a little bit of a tricky question. Okay. Question six, cicatricial pemphigoid may be associated with an internal malignancy, especially this variant associated with antigen. Is it a plectin, laminin-5, collagen-7, polis pemphigoid antigen-2, integrin alpha-6, beta-4? And we get most of the answer is B. And yes, it's laminin-5. And as you know, let's just have a quick revise. Blectin is associated with which? Which disease? You have to give me an answer. Blectin. No, it's epidermolysis bullosa simplex with muscular atrophy. With muscular dystrophy. Yes, Dr. Rajawahar, well done. Collagen 7. This is very important. Yes, it's with bullous lupus, with EP aquatiza, with dystrophic EP as well. Yes, well done, well done. Bullous pemphigoid antigen 2. We have lots of diseases with bullous pemphigoid antigen 2. At least one. Yes, it's with linear IgA disease, with the... With, uh, Pemphigoid gestationus with junctional EP with the classic CP as well. Okay, well done. Okay. And the last and not least, the integrin alpha 6 beta 4. Alpha 6 beta 4. Alpha 6, beta 4, very important as well. The junctional EP with bilaric stenosis. Okay, that's a quick revision. Okay, so question 7. Which type of hereditary epidermolysis bullosa is known for a long-term complication involving pseudosanodactyl of the hands and feet and the development of sequamous cell carcinoma? Is it EP simplex with muscular dystrophy? Is it junctional EP? Is it dominant dystrophic EP? Is it recessive dystrophic EP or EP simplex? Okay, I guess that only Dr. Mishael Jawahar and Dr. Amy is answering, so we have to get lots of you to wake up. Okay, and yes, that is the correct answer, recessive dystrophic EP. And as you see that recessive dystrophic EP, they have all very many and complicated uh, long-term consequence in the patient. They have continuous SCC, pseudocyanodactyl of the hands and feet, osteoporosis, a corneal blister, and ulceration with the scarring, ectropion, and uh, microstomia as well. Okay. The, remember the recessive dystrophic EP. Okay, question eight. Which chromosome is associated with patients who have a multiple cylindroma? Is it 16, 17, 15, 20, or chromosome X? And I, I guess this is one of the questions that most of you get it wrong as well. Okay. Well done, Dr. Mish'al and Dr. Amnira. Yes, it's a chromosome 16. So, do you know what is the name of the syndrome that associated with multiple syndroma and a trichoepitheloma, spiroadenoma? Yes, Dr. Jawahar, it's a brooks pledger syndrome and usually associated with a mutation uh, on the chromosome 16. How about chromosome 17? Does it ring your bell for any of um, the disease association? No, it's bird hoop dupe syndrome for chromosome 17. Okay, chromosome 15. Does it ring the bell? Any association? Quite difficult to remember. Okay, that's for Bloom syndrome. Chromosome 15 is for Bloom syndrome. Okay. Chromosome 20.
uh, that's for McCoon Albert syndrome. Want your participation chromosome X? This is very important. You have to know it. Chromosome X. Don't Dr. Nira, Dr. Mishael, Dr. Jawahar, Dr. Amy. Um, for incontinential pigment eye. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, question nine. All of the following are true of the histological feature of Kaposi sarcoma except often stain positive for HHB8. The promontory sign is a feature. Color rate of epidermis often surround the neoplasm. It is composed of slit-like vascular spaces lined with a spindle endothelial cell or eosinophilic pass and tricompositive hyaline globule sometimes it presents. Just concentrate, it's except. They are all a feature of Kaposi sarcoma except. Yes, Dr. Amy and Dr. Michel, uh, the wrong answer is C because what does that you know, indicate what that, that description for. It's actually color rate of epidermis surrounded with a neoplasm. Yes, Dr. Mishael, it's the biogenic granuloma. And the rest are a feature of Kaposi sarcoma. And just to remind you, these are the classical histological feature of Kaposi sarcoma with the vascular, full of vascular and the spindle cell and the promontory sign. You can see the promontory sign here. Very classical. Okay, so yes, so that was the wrong description for Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, question 10. Which of the following is the marker for melanosome? HMB45 is 100, melan A, MIFT, or Fontana? Yes, well done. It's HMB45. Yes, and that's the correct answer. Just to revise, MIFT is the melanos melanocyte nuclear stain with a high specificity. S100 can stain lots of things with a very low specificity. It can stain the muscle, the Langerhans cell, the adipocyte, the acrine as well. Melan A is for melanocyte differentiation. And Fontana is the melanin stain. Okay, so only the one for melanosome is uh, HMB. Okay, well done. Which of the following drug inhibit de novo purine synthesis as a mechanism of action? Is it azathioprine? You have to know your pharmacology. This is very important. Azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, cyclosporine, cyclophosphamide, or methotrexate? And we get two answer of mycophenolate mofetil, and that is correct because as a thioprene, it inhabits the DNA and the RNA synthesis. Okay, cyclosporine, if you have to remember, the cyclosporine inhabits the calcineurin by binding the cyclophilin. Okay, the cyclophosphamide is actually, it's, um, uh, it's a cell cycle non-specific because it's derived from the nitrogen master. Okay, the methotrexate, bind to dihydrofolate reductase, so that's why we have to give the patient folic acid supplement, okay? Okay, what is the most common cause of hypertension in this patient? That is an easy question. I think all of you get it right, actually. Okay, well done. That's renal artery stenosis, because this picture represents what? Yes, actually, multiple neurofibroma and patient with a neurofibromatosis. Okay, these are multiple neurofibroma and patient with a neurofibromatosis. And typically, the hypertension because of the renal artery stenosis, less likely due to the uh, pheochromocytoma. But the most common is the renal artery stenosis. Okay. Oh, question 13. Which of the following is a histological body typically found in a primary versal infection? 
primary varicella infection. You have to know because we go through the basic of histology. So that's kind of a revision for the histology. And we get most of the answers B and yes, that is the correct answer. It's codry type A bodies, yes. As you know, because it's present in the herpes simplex and the varicella zoster infection, and usually they characterize by the large eosinophilic intercellular inclusion surrounding by the clear halo cell. Okay, just remember the histological type of it. Okay. Uh, gonorrhea bodies are seen in which disease? Just to revise. Small box, Dr. Emil. Okay. <laughs> Okay, no problem. Codry type B inclusion body, where can we see them? Yes, in polio, well done. Yes, yes. Henderson Patterson bodies? Well done to all. Yes, it's a molluscum contagiosum. Correct. And the Russell body? Yes, yes. Rhinoscleroma and what other diseases as well? And granuloma inguinal, yes. Okay, that's a good revision for the histology. What laser best treat the port wine stain? It is intense pulse dye, pulse light, long pulse KTB, pulse dye laser, the long pulse NDAG, or the RBM. And most of you are going with C, and yes, that is the correct answer. It is the gold standard for the port wine with a range of 585 nanometer. You can still use the long pulse KTB, but the best will be the, the pulse dye laser, okay? And you can use the pulse dye laser for a variety of, um, uh, of a treatment of uh, vascular angioma. <laughs> Um, telangiectasia, cherry angioma, and buccloderma as well. Okay. And last question. Malacopsia is the most often caused by which of the following organism? Staph, Staph. or neobacterium, proteus, or klebsiella? Andy. And yes, it is a, it's a staph species. Um, and usually you can find them in the urinary tract and the GI as well. Okay, and um, Malacoplechia mostly caused by staph and E. coli. Okay, and what is the characteristic histo finding when you see the Malacoplechia? What does it called? Yes, Dr. Michel. It's the Michael Scott man bodies, okay? And these are what you see it at the layer of the pathophilic inclusion, consists of partially digested bacteria lead, uh, with, um, that lead to deposition of the calcium and um, iron. That is called Michael Scott man bodies, okay? And up we go, we are done. Well done um, to all of you. Thank you for answering the test. Um, and all to you, Dr. Amin, can I start your session. Dr. Amin, can you hear me? So, Dr. Amin will start the session. In yes, hi. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, uh, I'm, uh, I'm on now. Just give me a everyone can uh, can uh, take a one or two minutes break and we'll uh, we'll uh, start uh, soon
So everyone feel free to ask any questions uh, to Dr. Rauza uh, about the uh, quiz um, while I set up everything. And um, uh, I will let you know when we will start. It will be in a couple of minutes. Can everyone see my screen now? Hello? Yes. So you can see my screen. Okay, excellent. Okay, so um, just to make sure. My screen is there, right? You can see the next slide? Or you can't see the next slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect, perfect. So let's start then. <clears throat> this is our first uh, slide. So what we're gonna do here is that uh, we'll do, uh, it's mainly clinical pathological correlation. Um, I'll show you either a clinical or a pathology slide and uh, we'll come up with a differential diagnosis. Um, either everyone answers or I might ask people in specific, um, just for fun. Um, so here we have a histology image. If I'm gonna ask someone, I, I might uh, uh, ask my, uh, my future residents in Bahrain so that uh, they get used to me asking them questions, if that's okay. Um, because the people here are already used to me asking them questions. So um, can anyone tell me the differential diagnosis for this image? for this histology image. Okay, so Michelle says this is vacular interface dermatitis. Very good. What kind, there is a differential diagnosis yes for vacular interface dermatitis. Can you tell me what's your differential? Okay, so he says EM, SLE, DM, drug eruption, GVHD. I like this differential diagnosis. Um, so if we would go by them one by one, 
Um, GVHD, for example, um, yes, it could be uh, GVHD, but usually GVHD is one of the types of interface dermatitis that has less of an infiltrate than the rest, especially because the patients are already you know, immunocompromised and have very low uh, white cells. So usually, so usually um, the, uh, the infiltrate will be less. Um, uh, so that's one. Uh, number two, um, uh, drug eruption is possible, um, uh, DM is possible, SLE is possible, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah. So the rest of your, the differential diagnosis is possible, though, so I would say just GVHD is a little bit less likely than the rest. So um, let's see the clinical image and uh, what it tells us. So Mishal, uh, we'll stay with Mishal for this question. Now, based on what you saw um, in the uh, uh, in the histology and what you see in clinical, what would you um, uh, think the the diagnosis is? You can't see the clinical picture. Let me just try to fix the, what's going on here. Okay, do you see the full screen now? Does everyone see it as a full screen now? Okay, that's good, that's good, thanks. Um, sorry about earlier. So. So yeah, so Michelle, neonatal lupus, that is very good. So based on what you saw in the histology, it is an interface dermatitis with thinning. If you notice here, if you go back up, if you notice there's thinning of the epidermis. Um, and then uh, clinically, uh, very distinctive for a neonatal lupus. It looks, it looks very much like a subacute cutaneous lupus. Uh, and if you can see here, the annular arrangement central hypopigmentation with a surrounding reddish uh, um, erythematous border. Um, these, uh, these features are commonly seen with the neonatal lupus. Um, another sign that you might notice here is, is the, the raccoon sign where, where um, the, the rash surrounds the, the eye, as you can see here. That's very distinctive for neonatal lupus. Remember, neonatal lupus, you can compare it a lot with the subacute cutaneous lupus in terms of uh, the appearance of the lesions because they're both not non-scarring compared to DLE, but the locations usually differ. In, in uh, subacute cutaneous lupus, the lesions usually uh, do not occur in the face but occur in the trunk. Uh, neonatal lupus, they are mainly on the face. So a patient like this, the most important step to do is the investigation for this patient. Make sure that there is no heart problems like you know, congenital heart block make sure that the patient doesn't have a thrombocytopenia, skeletal malformations, or liver disorders, which uh, these are the four main uh, internal manifestations. The, the three other than the heart, the other three are, are preventable. The heart complication usually, like in a heart block, if it happens, usually it's, pre it's, it's present from birth. Next, so let's see, um, Dr. Jawahal. One of my residents in Bahrain. Uh, tell me, what's your differential for this uh, condition? Dr. Jawahal. No? Differential diagnosis. You can either use the audio or type your answers. So Jawah, angiokeratoma uh, is a good differential diagnosis, true. Um, but uh, so remember that everything you say is a learning opportunity. So, so do no one feel embarrassed about answering right or wrong. Um, so everything you say, you can learn from it. So uh, first of all, angiokeratoma is, is possible, yes. But um, it's usually it's, much more smaller in terms of lesions. So, so a lesion, uh, angiokeratoma almost never uh, becomes this size. So if you, if you compare, if you just see the smaller ones, yes, it could be, but the larger one is, uh, uh, makes it much less likely. Um, 
Zainab Masala Nevis Comedonicus. Usually, um, I, uh, I agree in terms of the distribution, it's like linear. But, uh, and the, the black dots, but if you see the, the, the bluish hue in the surrounding area and the large nodule, the nodule argues against uh, uh, um, uh, Comedonicus nevus and against the energy keratoma, but, but uh, yeah, this, uh, um, it's good uh, that you bring these uh, up. Um, so the, the things that are left that uh, are, are more likely are venous malformation and uh, glomangiomas. Both can look, uh, can have this appearance. So as usual, we'll get the help of uh, histology. So when you see the histology, which one of the two is this more likely? <coughs> is this more likely to be venous malformation or this more likely to be a glomangioma? So I got two different answers. One said VM, one said glomidioma. Um, that's correct, Jawaha now. Um, these, see, see these rounded cells are bordering the, 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 the large vascular space? These are glomus cells. Um, glomus cells are uh, cells that uh, are specialized in contracting and uh, opening up channels inside the blood vessels that allow shunting of blood to control the temperature. Um, they usually stain uh, with uh, different stains than, uh, than uh, normal vascular markers. Like they don't usually, they're not highly positive for CD31 or CD34. They're usually um, uh, uh, positive for other markers, like the ones for like pericytes, like for example, actin. So um, yes, uh, Michelle, so Michelle answered the actin of the mentin. Yeah, so it's usually, like I said, it's, uh, it uh, stays positive with uh, markers for smooth muscle more than vascular markers. So if you're in doubt, you can always use your, your stain. Um, uh, histologically, this can also mimic a, glomovenous, uh, a glomus uh, tumor, but in a glomus tumor, you would see much more glomus cells and much less vessels. In the glomedioma, you will see much more vessels, much more less glomus cells. And you will rarely ever see more than one row of uh, of uh, of uh, gloma cells in these uh, lesions. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next case. This one. Uh, let's see, Aisha Al Midfa. Aisha Al Midfa, one of our very good residents in in Bahrain. If she is still here with us. Um, let's see her answer our next case. Okay, I can't hear anything. Anyone else wants to help or wants to weigh in in the differential? Okay, so a dermoid, when someone says dermoid cyst, someone said a sorry cyst. I've never heard the uh, that type of cyst before. Um, um, also, she meant a dermal cyst or dermoid cyst. Okay, so dermoid cyst is valid. Nasal glioma and cephalus. I like Michelle's differential. So when you see a midline uh, uh, in, in, in between the eyes and the nose, uh, uh, in the nasal root, uh, uh, a nodule in a young age. These are the three most important differential diagnoses uh, to, to, to make. Um, could this lesion be connected to the, to the, to the um, CNS if it was a dermoid or nasal glioma, for, uh, for example? Because before I showed you an image that showed the, the lateral uh, eyelid and I said that it couldn't, so you don't need to, um, by uh, to make sure but yeah Iman Kabir says MRI mandatory which I agree with so the ones in the midline yes they could definitely be associated with CNS extension so I would be really careful about uh, uh, manipulating or, or removing these lesions without checking so let's go to the biopsy and see what uh, what this represents so can you see can can anyone tell me now what the more likely diagnosis is so it's a dermoid cyst, very good. So you can see the, the, the normal keratinization in the center. You can see the adnexal structures in the wall of the, of the um, uh, cyst. You can see your sebaceous glands, you can see complete pilosebaceous units, 
and the and the and the keratinization is a normal epidermal keratinization with a granular layer, as you can see here, unlike the um, uh, pyolysis. Moving on, so this is a tricky but interesting case. Um, would anyone uh, volunteer to tell me uh, what's going on here? <coughs> Oh, well, Michelle, papillomatosis. I like that. So I do see some papillomatosis. What else do you see? So um, someone said, uh, I don't know the name of this person. I, would be, I wouldn't be interested to know the name but, uh, because it's a correct uh, answer. So it is uh, SK. So there are features of seborrheic keratosis. And Michelle says there is basal hyperpigmentation. And I noticed how all of you, oh, MK, Mary Menogen. Uh, or, so um, um, I like how all of you ignored uh, what, uh, the dermis because uh, I agree with you that there's nothing wrong in the dermis. Uh, whatever we see is in the epidermis. And I like also how you use descriptive terms to, to, to say what's going on because nothing is pointing out to a specific condition. We see features of... Uh, SK, we see features of uh, basal hyperpigmentation and features of papillomatosis. So this, these features can be seen in, in, in many entities like, you know, seborrheic keratosis, epidermal nevi, acanthosis nigricans, um, uh, even sometimes even with CARP, uh, CARP. So um, it's very important for this to, to, to see how the lesion looks clinically in order to, um, to, uh, to, uh, have a better idea of what this is. So if this is the clinical, what would you say? Anyone? So actinic highlighters, does this, uh, okay, so I got two different answers. Um, one says uh, uh, actinic colitis. So clinically, I might think of actinic colitis, even though uh, actinic colitis uh, uh, usually is uh, uh, thinner. But yes, I, I wouldn't say that it cannot be this thickened. It could. But remember that actinic colitis mostly involves the lower lip. It it hardly ever involves the upper lip. So so um, I would really be skeptic about calling something uh, actinic colitis if it's involving the upper lip. And even more skeptic if, if the upper lip involvement is even more severe than the lower lip involvement. So um, that makes it a little less uh, likely, especially for a human being. Like, uh, you know, if, if a flamingo came to me and you know how flamingos have their heads mostly upside down while they're feeding. So, so their sun would go on more into their upper, <laughs> upper jaw um, uh, than the lower part. So they might have more actinic damage in the upper mandibular area, but uh, for human beings, uh, usually the lower uh, lip has more severe actinic damage. So that makes uh, uh, actinic colitis less likely, but I, 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 I like your differential. And then uh, Amy Wang said GI malignancy and uh, uh, based on that, this is acanthosis nigricans. And I agree with that. That is the correct answer. So the patient is having a severe acanthosis nigricans and when it involves the lip this severely, um, uh, this uh, uh, is usually associated with uh, Acanthosis, uh, uh, sorry, associated with a malignancy, um, malignancy acanthosis nigricans, and usually GI malignancy is the most common cause of, of that, but lung and hematological can also occur. Papilloma also could be possible, but uh, this confluent in the lips uh, makes it uh, less likely, but I like your differential diagnosis, you might. So, next case. Let's start to move on faster. I want you guys to, like, you know, shoot answers really fast. So we can cover more. Postulosaurus. Wow, that's a good uh, uh, the, the differential. I can see parakeratosis. I can see psoriasis form acanthosis. Um, subcorneal postulosis also possible. Subcorneal postular dermatosis. Why not? It's also possible. Even though usually, usually subcorneal pustule and dermatosis, especially Snedo Wilkinson, the pustule usually sits up on top of the epidermis rather than within the, the epidermis. So that's a hint for you that uh, it would be less likely. So pustular psoriasis is a, is, a, is a differential diagnosis. Nothing else? 
So um, Amy Huang um, looks psoriasis from an acryl. So I like pustular psoriasis. Yes, and uh, and uh, Michelle said pustular psoriasis was correct, but there's more than one type of pustular psoriasis. And Amy went one further and told us that uh, that this is a uh, acryl, and so it's most likely to be one of the acryl psoriasis. And Aisha also went one further and says it's acryl dermatitis of halopau, which uh, uh, also involves the acryl area. So. Right now, what we're talking about mainly is uh, based on the findings of, you know, psoriasiform changes and uh, big pustules. So we're talking about an acryl psoriasiform uh, entity. So all what's left is for us to see the clinical image to say, is this uh, palmar plantar pustulosis or is this uh, acrodermatitis of halupal? And both of you are correct when, uh, when it comes to pathology. But now that we saw the clinical, which one do you guys think is more likely? So palmar plantar pustulosis, I, I agree with you. Um, so this is a case of palmar plantar pustulosis. Um, uh, usually the lesions uh, uh, in most patients who have palmar plantar pustulosis, unlike other forms of psoriasis or pustular psoriasis, PPP usually does not, uh, is not associated with, with, uh, with the regular psoriasis elsewhere. Like uh, general pustular psoriasis, for example, uh, almost always occur in patients who have uh, chronic plaque psoriasis. And the same thing with the uh, with acrodermatitis, acrodermatitis of halopal. Um, but uh, palmar plantar pustulosis, believe it or not, is usually just uh, a condition that involves the palms and sores. And some try to distance it from the rest of psoriasis because even in treatment, it does not usually respond to the typical treatments of, uh, of psoriasis. Like, you know, give these patients NTTNF, they're not going to get better uh, as fast as, as the patient with the regular psoriasis would be. These guys would. Uh, or, or girls would be uh, red president would would would, uh, would uh, improve very well with retinoids and uh, there's been some studies uh, proving that interleukin 17 can help uh, with the treatment okay moving on <coughs> a little tricky one uh, as well here come on shoot someone shoot so uh, shoot an answer ECM, I like that, so that's easy. So you saw the 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 the, the center, um, but um, I I agree with you in principle that it's a bull's eye. But remember, uh, ECM usually has a, a a pink center which represents a bite. Over here we see a pigmented lesion. So uh, inflamed nervous, I like that differential. And targeted hemisphere hemisphere I like that because. Uh, targeted hemisphere hemangioma can have a more dark blue or blackish center, which could look like a nevus. So I like these two differential diagnoses, targeted hemisphere hemangioma, uh, which I actually like to call hobnail hemangioma because it is the true hobnail hemangioma, unlike other conditions that are described as hobnails. So with this differential, let's see the histology. What do we see on histology here? Look at the epidermis. What do you see in the epidermis, especially in this area? By the way, anyone who wants to answer by audio, you, you feel free to answer by audio. The only problem is that with, with us is that who, if someone has the audio on with a match or, or, or kids in the background, but if you want to answer with audio, you could, and you could type, it's fine. But uh, so we, um, since no one answered, do we see a lot of spongiosis in the epidermis? If you can see here, even at this low power, you can see that the cells are separated from each other. So we see a lot of spongiosis in the epidermis. And then the dermis, we see uh, nested uh, uh, melan melanocytes uh, in a wedge shape and in and, 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 and regularness, well-defined. So we see a normal nevus in the center with all the spongiosis in the epidermis. So based on these findings, what would you surmise in terms of uh, clinical pathologic correlation if we want to go back uh, here? Anyone? Am I still in the meeting? Because uh, uh, I can't hear anyone and no one's answering. I just want to make sure everyone's still there. Halo Nevis. Um, a Halo Nevis, so Amy Huang. 
halo nevus usually would not have this erythematous border. You're just going to have a, 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 a nevus in the center and white pigmentation around it. So that's clinically against the halo nevus. Um, and number two, on histology in a halo nevus, you see a severe lichenoid infiltrate that you wouldn't even see the melanocytes. Sometimes you need to, you know, use melanocyte stains in order to see the melanocytes because of the dense uh, um, uh, lichenoid infiltrate. So with the spongiosis, this is what we call a, uh, an eczematous nevus or a, or a myosin's nevus. A myosin's nevus is a is a is a is a an inflamed or a or an eczematous nevus. Um, you can see this in Bologna. It's a very interesting entity, and, and it, it, it often presents in clinics. So, so it's just something to be aware of, in order not to to, to overdiagnose something as a as a uh, ominous uh, entity. Um, <laughs> so, if you see here uh, uh, clinically, uh, what what you need to do most importantly is uh, do a dermoscopy of the central lesion itself. And on biopsy, we need to make sure that this is a, just a nevus that is eczematous and not a, a, a severely dysplastic nevus or a melanoma that is becoming uh, inflamed, okay? So moving on to the next case. Anyone? Maryam and Najim, come on. Dr. Maryam and Najim, I wanna hear you answer this. Uh, so psoriasis so is a, good, a very good differential diagnosis. I like that differential. What else? Um, Cesare, um, possible, why not? Um, I would need to see the rest of the body, but uh, it is possible, the laminated uh, fishery uh, PPK. PRP, I also like that. Hand eczema, of course. We always think of the common entities. Um, hand eczema definitely would be in my differential diagnosis. Um, anything else? LP, I like LP as I didn't see uh, Iman al Kabi said LP. I really like LP as a differential diagnosis. Let's go quickly to the histology. So histology is quite uh, you know, self-explanatory here in this image. Um, I'll just leave it to, to the first person who typed the answer. Um, so we can see here, obviously, there's a compact hyperkeratosis. There is a high, uh, irregular hypergranulosis. There is a canthosis. There are saw two, three T ridges. And there's a band-like infiltrate in the dermal in the, uh, epidermal uh, interface. And all these are features of lichen planus. And uh, so um, the diagnosis here would be lichen planus. Uh, good job to uh, Iman, who said that from clinical. Let's go back to the clinical and see, does this look like lichen planus? Even though if you notice the, the palms look like any of the entities we talked uh, about earlier, but uh, if you can see here, look at the more proximal area towards the wrist. You would see more features that are in line with uh, lichen planus. You know, the, 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 the flat top papules, you see it's breaking out from the plaques, breaking out into flat top papules in the proximal area, like here. You can see these, these are uh, quite distinctive for lichen planus compared to the other entities that we spoke about. And definitely histology helps here in, uh, in the diagnosis, which uh, is, all, uh, is what we expect. What is this? Everyone or anyone? I notice you guys uh, have uh, uh, slowed down now in terms of your quickness to, to diagnose. What happened to Mishal and Maryam and uh, Jawahal? You, you were faster earlier. Come on. Let's hear your answer. So, um, eczema herpeticum, Amy Huang. And Amy Huang, I forgot to mention Amy Huang, usually answers uh, really well. Um, so, what we see here are more, more likely to be, um, um, someone is asking me, is it pustos? You, I don't know, you tell me. So especially here, what I see is more like flesh colored uh, papules. Some of them are even shiny or pearly, I would say. Um, there are not very much of vesicles or pustules. So uh, Dr. T says, um, MC, which I assume means the molluscum contagiosum, that's a very good differential diagnosis. 
Um, so mer um, a molluscan condition is a, is a good differential diagnosis. Um, uh, someone else said eczema herpeticum. Like if we were if we were vesicles, I would assume eczema herpeticum. But usually, eczema herpeticum would pre present with intense uh, intense uh, inflammation that we can that we do see here. But we're usually with vesicles and pustules and 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 more like hemorrhagic vesicles that are uh, starting to rupture. So that would make it less likely. Let's. Um, so if this is a molluscum, but why why is there a lot of inflammation here? Let's see histology. So in histology, we'd see, we would see a huge amount of inflammation at the base. And yes, we do see some features of molluscum. I just show you this example of this condition here because I want you to be aware that molluscum contagiosum can sometimes trigger an inflammation, uh, either a foreign body reaction or a pustular reaction or a severe lichenoid or eczematous reaction. And the features or Henderson, Patterson, molluscum bodies can sometimes be less obvious. But still, you can see them here. You can see the cup-shaped lesion. And there is a hint of some old uh, Henderson uh, molluscum bodies. Um, so yes, this is a case of molluscum uh, contagiosum um, that is inflamed. So if you see this patient for, uh, in, in your clinics for the first time, before you start treating them for molluscum, you have to start treating them with atopical steroids to reduce the eczema because uh, scratching the area would spread it to other areas. So, so you first control the inflammation and then you can treat the, the molluscum that's in this area. Moving on to this one. Come on, someone uh, give me a differential diagnosis before I choose uh, someone to answer. Let's see. Fatma Samiri. Fatma Samiri, okay. Uh, so Amy Huang. Amy Huang uh, says deep fungal infection, that is good. Hypertrophic lupus uh, uh, is good. Hypertrophic lichen planus is very good, um, especially the location of the lesion. So, so uh, I like all three uh, differential diagnoses here. And this is, to be honest, what the three of the things I would think of if I saw this patient. But uh, obviously, given how different the, the, the differential diagnoses are, the next step would be taking a biopsy. And uh, I will leave anyone chance to answer uh, before we see histology. So what do we see on histology? As Son says, we see features of lichen simplex chronicus. So if you can see here, we got our irregular parakeratosis in the stratum corneum. Some areas see our hyperkeratotic, some areas are parakeratotic. Um, we see the vertical blood vessels uh, here, and there's a lot of fibrosis in this upper dermis. So these are features of uh, lichen simplex chronicus or even parigo nodularis, depending on what we see in the clinical image. And again, they see the irregular hypergranulosis. So these are features of lichen simplex chronicus. So when we go back, can this be lichen simplex chronicus? It definitely can. So, so the reason why I showed you this image and this condition is that always think of the common entities. Yes, we do see deep fungal infections. We do often see hypertrophic lupus. We do often see hypertrophic lichen planus, but by far lichen simplex chronicus, we see it much more often than any of the other entities combined. And, uh, and uh, so always remember that, you know, uh, there's uh, sometimes you, you have to put your exam hats on and, you know, be prepared for what they're gonna ask you in exam. And the exams are not gonna ask you very much about LSC, I, 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 I agree and I admit, but in real life, yeah, sometimes you have to put your clinical hat. And uh, when you see this in a clinic, Think of LST much, uh, much uh, more likely, or, or much more than if you think of uh, the other entities like you know, deep fungal or hypertrophic lupus or hypertrophic lichen planus. So this is just a clinical uh, lesson for you to to be aware of. Moving on to the next case. As you can see here, reticulated erythema some hyperpigmentation. Confluent and reticulated papillomatosis. Um, I like that. Very good differential diagnosis. That's one. Any other entity? I don't know what PP. I guess uh, parigopigmentosa. Yes, that is correct. Very good differential diagnosis. 
Um, anything else? SCLE, um, I have to say I do agree with SCLE. Um, lesions are usually annual, but you know, any annual lesion can break out, break down and, and give like, you know, a polycyclic or articulated appearance. I wouldn't say no. Perigo, um, if you're being perigo simplex, yeah, it could be definitely perigo simplex. Um, so with me, this condition is mostly a clinical diagnosis and I do agree that this is most likely, uh, I agree with Michelle, that this is more likely or much more likely to be uh, perigo pigmentosa. But uh, I, again, agree with the rest of you when you tell me CARP and, uh, and SCLE, that's why I would biopsy to just rule out the other two entities. And if I don't see features of SCLE and I don't see features of CARP, um, I would uh, go to the diagnosis of uh, perigo pigmentosa. So what we see here, I, um, I didn't show you the epidermis, but I showed you the dermis here, um, sorry. The dermis here, and you can see uh, a normal lymphohistocytic infiltrate that you would see with any uh, uh, inflammatory condition. But what you see here are pigment incontinence, as you can see here, some of the, the macrophages are starting to eat up the melanin. So they're melanophages. And uh, if you can see the up the, uh, above it is the epidermis with the, uh, if I wouldn't say any, uh, there's not much of an interface dermatitis. So this, uh, this, uh, these features here, like, you know, I, I don't show you the epidermis, but norm, that if you, if you would have biopsied this patient and you saw the epidermis, you would see a normal epidermis and uh, you wouldn't see any interface changes. Um, so um, the diagnosis here would be uh, perigo pigmentosa, which is uh, usually more common in, in East Asian individuals or people from that descent. Um, especially Japanese or, or Chinese individuals. Um, there are um, uh, uh, studies that uh, link it to a keto diet. I agree with uh, Jawaha. Um, uh, but uh, even though there are studies that link it to a, a higher ketogenic diet, for some reason when uh, uh, stopping the ketogenic uh, diet, um, there are studies that uh, show that, um, that it hasn't been effective in treating, but I, 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 I like how you link that up to the keto diet. So it's a good, it's a good thing that means you're reading uh, literature, which is good. But I just thought of adding that information to you. So to me, the treatment would be mostly uh, with topical or oral, or, or oral antibiotics uh, to suppress the inflammation. Uh, moving on, what do we see here? So here we're seeing the histology first. There's a perivascular infiltrate. These cells, there's a certain cell that is usually not present in every infiltrate. Can anyone tell me what the cell is? So we see eosinophils. So, um, you know, uh, uh, they're mostly eosinophils. I agree, they can look at like plasma cells from this power, but they're too pink to be plasma and uh, more likely to be eosinophils here. But I agree with you that plasma cells can, uh, they might mimic plasma cells, but they're eos. Um, so, uh, eosinophilic dermatosis, okay? So that's what I wanted you to get from the, from the, um, from the histology. And then we'll move on to clinical. So Michal is, uh, is really ahead of, his, uh, uh, ahead of himself. Um, let's see clinically. I did not see, to be honest, I didn't see much of a hobnail sign, but uh, let's see the clinical. So you got an using a filic infiltrate, and then you got this rash. Uh, very good. Uh, 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 so when someone said using a filicolitis, someone said Ufuji. Uh, if I would see only these uh, papules, especially in the upper trunk, I would uh, think of eosinophilic folliculitis, but remember eosinophilic folliculitis usually involves the head and neck and upper trunk. Usually the lower trunk is less involved than uh, in eosinophilic folliculitis. But what uh, is uh, striking here is the deck chair sign, as Mishal said, he's, he's really building up his case for uh, Ofuji, which uh, I agree with. So, um, and in the next image, you can see it's very obvious that uh, uh, the, the, there is flexural sparing. So the bottom image is the one that you're gonna see more often in an exam. The top image is the one that you're more, more, more likely to see in real life, as you can see here. Not very obvious, but you, you need to look for it in order to, 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 to see it. So I am uh, seeing somewhat of sparing here in the flexural area, 
even around the umbilicus, which is some form of a flexure as well. Um, so this is a, a Fuji disease, um, also mostly seen in uh, Japan. Um, some studies link it uh, up with uh, with conditions like you know lymphomas or or any other type of uh, immunodeficiency uh, like HIV. Um, so um, yeah, and uh, this has to put the potential of turning into a full blown erythroderma. Uh, um, uh, Let's move on. What do we see here? Anyone? So we see some parakeratosis, someone's going from the top down. So yeah, there are areas of parakeratosis, I agree. There are perivascular, some, some lymphocytes, yeah. What else? <coughs> there is exocytosis, yes, I agree, and spongiosis. So yeah, there is some spongiosis and exocytosis. I agree with all what you've been saying. How do the vessels look like? So there are a few exacerbated reds that I agree with. So that's what I all wanted you to see. And so we move on to the clinical. Wait, oh wait, no, I didn't ask you about your differential about what you saw, sorry. <laughs> so let's say, let's see the differential based on what we saw here. So someone said the exostosis, someone said spongiosis, someone said mild perichiatosis, um, uh, um, prevascular lymphocytic infiltrate, uh, some uh, exacerbated RBCs. So, so all these findings, what would your differential diagnosis be? Forget you saw the image. Pleva, I like that, but um, pleva, what goes against pleva here is uh, that there is absolutely no interface change. So there is no interface change. And I like how you use the word dirty horn. So not everyone uses that term, but I actually like that. Um, dirty horn means that uh, uh, there's perichiatosis with neutrophils as well, uh, which we do not see here. You see it usually with psoriasis, syphilis, pleva, um, subderm. Um, so we don't see a, 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 a neutrophilic horn and we don't see an interface dermatitis makes pleva less likely. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so when you see an inflammatory fluid cell, you should always think what's more mostly most uh, prominent. So what, what's most prominent here is a prevascular infiltrate and a spongiosis. So to me, this, is, this would fall more under the spongiotic dermatitis, especially since there's no psoriasiform changes, there's no lichenoid changes, there's no interface changes. So for me, it's mostly going towards the, the, the side of a uh, spongiotic derm. Um, there is exacerbated RBCs, which can sometimes happen when there's intense uh, inflammation and scratching of the area. So let's go to clinical. So spongiotic dermatitis and this. So what do you think this is? So EAC, uh, again, so Dr. Aishan Musa, EAC looks very good. If you go back to the histology, I agree with EAC in terms of like, you know, some areas of spongiosis, but EAC usually wouldn't have a confluent uh, spongiosis. You usually, usually have a focal spongiosis and focal perichiatosis. The, uh, the perichiatosis here is, is very wide and uh, the spongiosis is wide, very wide. So it's mostly a spongiotic germ. So Claude Mahanda said lip flickers uh, dermatitis. So to go back a little bit, um, and uh, and uh, sorry, and the Iman as well said, uh, so, and Amy said contact germ. So when I see a patient's lips and I see the histology that would show me a spongiosis, I would think of three entities. I would think of contact dermatitis, lip liquor's dermatitis, which is a specific type of contact dermatitis, which is not from, let's say, lipsticks or nails or, or I mean, nail polish or anything. And I would think of atopic, uh, atopic uh, uh, chylitis. So, or pre-artificial dermatitis, I have to say, Michelle, is much less likely because I don't usually see the, the papules and pustules of, that are acneiform. What I see is ex, are excoriations. 
So back to the free differential I differential diagnosis I propose. Um, let's pick at them one by one. Number one, uh, in the atopic chylitis, usually you would see a lot of fissuring in the in the lip, which uh, I don't uh, see here. Um, so uh, and you would see a lot of dryness around the the mouth, which I don't again I do not see here. With contact dermatitis, you would see involvement again of the lips as much as you would see the involvement of the of the area around the lips. And you would see involvement of the upper and lower lips. And in, in this case, I don't see upper or lower lip, invo uh, lip involvement. What I see is only involvement of the skin around the lips. So of the three differential diagnoses that we propose, to me, uh, definitely by far the most likely uh, diagnosis would be lip liquor's dermatitis, like Fat Mahamdin and uh, Iman Kabi said. So lip liquor's dermatitis is definitely much more likely here. And usually lip liquor's lick the skin around their lips uh, in the bottom half much more than the upper half. And as you can see here, it's manifesting. As you can see, there's much more PIH uh, or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation in the lower lip area than in the upper lip area. Moving on. Can anyone tell me the diagnosis here? So dermatomyositis by Amy Huang, uh, Gutron's papules. I like that differential diagnosis. Very good. What else? Anyone else wants to weigh in? Anyone wants to tell me more differential diagnosis? Irritant contact dermatitis. Very good. Erythroderma. Um, Michelle, you can't say erythroderma without seeing the rest of the skin. So, and uh, uh, if you were thinking that this is erythema, no, this is just the regular patient's color, but you can never say erythroderma based on just seeing the hand of the patient, even if this was all erythematous. Let's say this maybe it was just contact dermatitis that's limited to the hand for some reason. Anyone else wants to weigh in on the differential diagnosis? SLE, I like SLE, that is good. Vod uh, Mohammed donut sign, it could be. Donut sign usually is not too scaly though, but uh, in terms of texture, it does look like a donut sign, but uh, it, it has much more scales. So, so a lot of the differential diagnosis we got so far, we got the uh, uh, scleroderma, we got uh, SLE, we got uh, um, contact dermatitis, irritant contact dermatitis in specific. And uh, we've got, um, Someone who said, uh, Amy Huang said, uh, um, dermatomyositis. Knuckle psoriasis, definitely, I'm, I, if I, I, I'm glad someone uh, mentioned it. Bart Humphrey, a type of uh, ichthyosis, which I also like. So all of you are correct. But um, let's, see the, let's see the histology. And what do we see on histology? What, what's the inflammatory pattern that strikes you to your, on your face here? Um, is it psoriasiform? Is it lichenoid? Is it interface? Is it spongiotic? Is it a chthyosiform? It's spongiotic. So sp uh, spongiotic dermatitis. Let's go back to what we saw in the clinical. Spongiotic dermatitis. Can this be spongiotic? Yes, it could. This is a case of irritant contact dermatitis, which uh, I think uh, Iman Kabi answered correctly. So. I put this example again to always remind you, just like we saw earlier with the lichen simplex chronicus case, um, common things are common. Sometimes you have to wear your exam hat. Sometimes you have to wear your clinical hat. And uh, in an exam, yeah, the, I'm sure they love to ask you about you know, dermatomyositis and, and lupus and several other entities that you never ever see in clinic, uh, like, like Bart Humphrey, for example, uh, in the exams. But um, in real life, when you see a patient like this, the first thing you have to ask is the history. What, what work do they do? What hobbies do they have? Um, uh, by work, I mean like, you know, both work inside the house and work outside the house. And sometimes the patient will just tell you the answer. Tell you, yeah, I, I do a lot of gardening. I do a lot of dishwashing or, or I do a lot of boxing, for example. Like I, my, one of my hobbies is boxing. So um, uh, in this case, this is a case of irritant contact dermatitis. And I just use this as an example, not to trick you, but to, to, to uh, let you know that it can sometimes mimic the patterns of uh, connective tissue disease 
And so um, obviously the, what we see here is a case of, uh, of, uh, uh, of an irritant contact dermatitis. Moving on here, what do we see in this image? Ulcerations, red papules. So uh, these red whitish papules, uh, so DM is a very good differential diagnosis again, very good. And we see ulcerations, scarring, and papules. And these papules we call the milia, if you notice, like, you know, they're whitish uh, 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 mini cysts in the skin. So it usually happens due to scarring from a long term process. So Misha says EBA, very good differential diagnosis. So Gaston says PCT, very good. Amy Wang says porphyria, so Akhnezi said PCT, I guess. I like all of your differential diagnosis. Um, so EBA, PCT, always uh, 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 remember, um, okay, I'm not gonna give you the answer, but uh, anyone else has any differential diagnosis? Just remember when you, EED, very good. I like EED. So remember when you, when you say EBA, uh, just keep in mind that you know, EB also is, would be part of the differential diagnosis, which I, I assume you, are, you know that. So, so you guys wanna see the histology? Let's see the histology. What's this histology? So Hassan said herpes. I mean, herpes is more of an acute condition. It's not gonna give you melia in the long term. So Michelle says LSC with an exclamation point, which uh, I like. So again, going back to this image. So yes, there are features of LSC and excoriation. And LSC, just like any other chronic itchy condition, can and will and always does uh, uh, lead to scarring in the area and, uh, and the areas that scar can also develop melia. So LSC is not less than other entities in terms of abilities to cause uh, melia. And uh, as I said before, and I will tell you again, sometimes you have to uh, think like uh, you're in an exam, sometimes you think you're, like you're in a clinic. And um, I like to, to, to make you aware of both. Um, when you see a patient in your clinic, always uh, entertain the possibility of the commoner entity. So this is a, basically a case of lichen suplex chronicus, who has been itching his hand for a very long time and I mean, scratching his hand for a very long time and then developed uh, features uh, of uh, scarring and, uh, and melia in the area. And yes, dermatomyositis can have these findings, EBA can have these findings, PCT can have these findings. But then again, if you combine all the cases of PCT, EED, porphyria, uh, or um, um, EBA, and DM, you'll see all of them together, they're not gonna be as common as the cases of LSC you're gonna see in your clinics. So, so um, always remember, common things are common. This uh, image, this patient, this is the axilla, of course. Stryphe, very good, I like Stryphe. Poikilodermatis differential diagnosis. Look, I see an erythema, but I don't see much of uh, telangiectasia, hyper, hypopigmentation. There's some PIH, yes, but um, not much of a poikiloderma. Intertrigo uh, from Dr. T. So, um, and I got contact then from Marshall Musa and uh, sparing of the inner axilla, very good. So, um, heat trash. Very good. I like it how, that everyone is participating now. Um, so let's pick them out again, one by one. So stryphe, uh, which is symmetric, regulated, intertriginous, and flexural eruption, that and, uh, and uh, intertrigo usually would involve uh, the flexures much more than the areas uh, just outside the flexures. So that makes it a little bit less likely. Erythrasma is a very good differential diagnosis. Um, again, it does usually involve the flexures, but I have seen cases where it involves the areas just outside the flexures. And in that case, it's usually very easily um, ruled out by wood lamp. So that's a good differential diagnosis. I like heat trash, but also heat trash. Remember, it usually presents with more papules rather than large patches. Um, uh, so that makes it less likely. 
Mishal uh, says checks out dermatitis and uh, just like Aisha said, uh, contact dermatitis. So um, let's see histology. And yes, we do see a spongiotic derm again. So three spongiotic derms back to back. And uh, this is all to push down to the point of how common things are common. And uh, yes, let's uh, focus now on the clinical image. Um, textile dermatitis is actually the correct answer. So um, when you have contact dermatitis in the axillary area, remember, in, in, in my experience, it usually uh, comes from three entities, either due to creams that people apply in the area, or uh, due to deodorants or sprays, or due to clothes. Uh, what makes clothes uh, special uh, compared to the rest is that with clothes, usually it spares the direct flexure. Why? Because when you fl flex your arms, this part of skin all around here is protected from your clothes and, and uh, your clothes are not gonna interact with this area much as much as it would be, uh, interact with the area just outside the flexures. And, and if you see how your clothes are usually worn, the areas that are mostly pressed against your clothes are the area just outside your, 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 your armpit and in, the, and in the waist areas and uh, in your upper back and shoulder areas. These areas are the most areas that are pressed against. Like, you know, this area, for example, is pressed against your shirt much more than this area. So this is quite distinctive, involving mostly the areas just outside the flexure of the armpit for textile uh, contact dermatitis. So very good for all of you. Oops, sorry, I, uh, I made a boo-boo. Let me go back to the uh, images here. Okay, well, we're very far from, uh, from finishing. Um, let's uh, move on. So Imakari, we can see this mainly in hot season. Um, so you're talking about textile dermatitis, but generally speaking, textile dermatitis can happen any time of the year. Um, maybe more in the hot season because, you know, increased sweating and maceration make the skin more susceptible to, to, aller to irritants and allergens. That is, that is a possibility. Okay, moving on to the next case. Anyone has an idea with regards to the differential diagnosis? Deep fungal infection, very good. Two people, one has a cutaneous horn. Um, cutaneous horn usually, Michelle, would, uh, usually involves one lesion. Yeah, I, I personally have seen patients with cutaneous horn, both as a, both as a clinician and as a dermatopathologist. I have never seen a patient with, with uh, three or four cutaneous horns at the same time. Invasive SCC, I like that, but remember, uh, again, the multi-loculated uh, uh, appearance makes it a little less likely. Chromomycosis, I love chromomycosis as a differential diagnosis. VTVC, I don't know what VTVC is. Uh, chromoblastomycosis, tuberculosis, varicosis, cutis, yes, uh, I, 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 I like that very good differential diagnosis, tuberculosis, varicosis, cutis. Um, uh, ver, um, uh, cutaneous TB, so yeah, yeah. So you, we got cutaneous TB, we got the uh, so so your differential diagnosis is mostly infectious or neoplastic conditions, which I like. And given the multi-loculated appearance, I would lean more towards the infectious entities. So um, so um, I don't know what Michelle means by papillomatosis cutis or papillomatitis papillomatosis cutis. Um, Verrucous carcinoma, okay. Again, the verrucous carcinoma, I like that differential, but um, it's multiple locations. It may, okay, definitely it's a possibility, but I would, uh, I, would, uh, I would favor an infection here. So let's see in histology. So in histology, one of the most important features you would see in a, in a, uh, when a, with a deep fungal or a, or, a, or, a, or a tuberculous infection is a mixed infiltrate in the dermis and a pseudocatillomatous hyperplasia above it, which we can see here. And some, and if you can see here, that uh, the cutaneous horn is really reflected in your, in your, um, uh, uh, in the histology. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see how a uh, mixed infiltrate it is. You got your giant, giant, giant cell here, and that's not very typical. Then that your normal giant cell is a really 
huge cell with a with a with a horseshoe shape, which goes with a TB or sarcoidosis. And then you got your mixed in filters. You got some neutrophils. You got some some uh, ma macrophages. So any patient who presents with uh, uh, neutrophilic granulomatous dermatitis and uh, pseudepithelomatous hyperplasia, the first thing you do is stain for organisms. So when we stain for organisms in this patient, we saw this. So we, even without me telling you what stain we did, these small intracellular organisms, are they more likely to be bacteria or more likely to be fungi? So we shall say acid fast bacilli and so So yes. These are acid fast bacilli. So, so um, uh, what stain did we use to find these? Either fight or azeal neosin stain. So very good. So um, these both can be used, but in this case, we, it's a fight stain. And um, now that I can show you the full image, which I didn't show you earlier. So this, I think kind of uh, really sums up the diagnosis as you can see here. You can see a strongly positive PPD. And remember, with your cutaneous TB patients, um, there are um, different levels of immunity and give you different levels of lesions. If a patient has a very poor immunity, they will have a ne negative PBT death and they would have uh, cutaneous TB features like you know the, the, the tuberculous gamma or the disseminated miliary TB. Uh, patients who have relatively strong immunity uh, would get uh, features like um, uh, TB varicosa cutis if it was the first exposure, or they would get like features like you know lupus vulgaris if it was a secondary uh, uh, feature. Next, by the way, um, uh, it's uh, we reached the end uh, of uh, the timing, and uh, so it's all depending on you guys. Would you guys prefer to stay a few minutes longer to finish one or two more cases since uh, you all are here, or uh, uh, you guys want to leave. So yeah, I got two people, if, if, uh, three people. If two more people tell me to continue, I'll continue. <laughs> so um, yeah, okay, Zainab, so yeah, okay. Zainab is good enough for me for two people. So uh, so yeah, yeah, they also continue. So yeah, let's continue a little bit more. We're all having fun here. So target to a team of multi for me. So Emmanuel Kabi noticed something that, uh, uh, so I, I presented this slide before and people noticed the erythema multiforme, but nobody noticed this, which is a very good catch uh, on behalf of, uh, of uh, Iman. And, um, and uh, yes, um, uh, uh, when we can see the histology of that lesion, as you can see here, um, very obvious uh, features of reticular epidermal necrosis that you would see with all with with many of the pox viruses like you know small pox or 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 or, or, um, or, or for example um, uh, the reticular degeneration is very distinctive for it so yes uh, I I put this slide for you to always remember that yes uh, HSV is is by far the most common cause of uh, of erythema multiforme, and sometimes it can be just almost synonymous in terms of cause and effect. But uh, there are a, a bunch of other viruses that can that can give you this uh, this uh, these features, and uh, one of them is uh, is uh, ORF. Moving on, this is a very interesting case. If someone tells me the diagnosis clinically, uh, you'll get uh, you you deserve an award. PRP, very good. I like PRP, Petrosis ruba pilaris. What else? Note the arrangement of the lesions. Segmented purpur of Mejuchi, it, it, it is possible, but uh, I've never seen a patient who developed in the both dorsum and ventral arm uh, with, uh, with this. Usually it involves the, 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 the legs, but... Um, um, I, I can't always say no. Um, dengue um, usually involves with the confluent erythema rather than papule. But look at the arrangement. It's more of a reticulated net-like arrangement. Let's see the histology. It might help a little bit. On histology, what do we see? We see a lichenoid infiltrate, lichenoid infiltrate, as you can see here, with clefting. So uh, this is what we call Max Joseph space. 
Um, so Fatma said, Purple virus clinically, yes, it could be a Barber virus infection, especially the hand, uh, the glove and stock uh, syndrome. But uh, now with histology, when you see a lichenoid infiltrate with all the features of lichen planus, like, you know, the, the, the wedge, the, 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 the saw toothing of the reach ridges, the wedge shaped hypergranulosis, the hyperkeratosis without parakeratosis. Um, the, 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 the band like infiltrate. So these are features of, uh, of uh, uh, a lichenoid disorder. And uh, two of you answered it correctly. Michel said Nikam and uh, Jawara said keratosis lichenoidus chronica, and both of them are, are synonymous with each other. Uh, this is an extremely rare condition. I just put it because, you know, again, I know I want to teach you about clinical stuff, but I also want to prepare you for your exams. And, and this is the kind of stuff they might ask you in exams. Um, so when it comes to these characters, it's looking like this chronic. Now let's move on. Annular, crusted, I would say some papular component crusted involving the arms. Porokeratosis, I like that. I like porokeratosis as a differential diagnosis. That's, that's good. GA, yeah, why not GA? Even though GA um, uh, usually, I mean, no, I, I, I take it back. I was just going to say GA it does not usually have a epidermal component, but uh, on rare instances, it can have like, you know, a perforating GA field or appearance. EPS and EAC are both correct. Um, so let's see histology. Histology, I think, is pretty obvious here, right? So yeah, you have your extruding material through the epidermis and uh, and uh, from uh, from what it appears to be, uh, the, uh, because it's like you know thinner rather than wide, you know the collagen uh, 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 extrusion usually in like uh, for example um, um, uh, uh, the, the renal disease patients who have perforating dermatosis usually is a wider uh, um, base. Uh, the narrower usually uh, the base usually goes more towards the elastotic condition. So yeah, this is a case of EPS. Uh, which uh, has uh, several causes, but I won't go through them now because you, you know them very well. This diagnosis here. <coughs> Bowen's disease, LPLK, very good, very good. SCC, yeah, uh, um, I like this differential diagnosis. Let's go to histology. And yes, you can see here that there's uh, marked atypia only involving the epidermis, not invading through the dermis. So um, there is no lichenoid infiltrate, which, which makes LPLK less likely. And um, yeah, so this is a case of SCC in situ, which uh, uh, sometimes it takes the name of Bowen's disease. Very good. This papular lesion in the, in the eyebrow. Small papule here. Trichofolliculoma, very, very good. Trichofolliculoma. So, and you can see it here with histology. Very nice, like a big hair follicle with a little baby follicles coming all uh, outside it. Let's do one more case. One more. Radiation dermatitis, acute or chronic. Grover disease, I like Grover disease as a differential diagnosis. Verrucous por uh, porokeratosis, Darius disease, pa patelloid seborrheic dermatitis. I like patelloid seborrheic dermatitis, yes. Uh, I like Darius disease. What do you, who, do you mean by verrucous porokeratosis? Because I am not familiar with that term. Do you mean porokeratosis psychotropica, which uh, usually involves the gluteal area rather than, uh, than the upper back? Radiation dermatitis, I would think of it less likely um, because of the distribution of the lesions. Uh, carp would be definitely less likely. I wouldn't uh, call this carp uh, um, uh, because if you see the peeling in the center, there's, see, it's weeping and peeling in the center. Uh, candidiasis, absolutely, I would think of candidiasis. The first thing I actually would see when I see this patient is that I would scrape it and KOH it and make sure that a, the patient is not swarming with candida. And especially if this was a bedridden patient, for example, 
Miliaria rubra is uh, definitely will, will be in my differential diagnosis. So miliaria rubra, candidiasis, uh, seborrheic dermatitis, diarrhea definitely would be in my differential diagnosis. You guys want to add anything else? Since it's our last case, I want you to add your differential diagnosis because uh, I will. I have news for you. Uh, all what you said is correct in terms of differential diagnosis, but you did not reach the diagnosis yet. Petrosis rosa is possible, I have to say, but uh, not uh, not uh, not more likely than the other entities, especially with this presentation. Um, I don't understand what Imosa's term from here, sponge. PF, uh, eczema, so someone said eczema, it could be eczema. Maybe Iman means uh, spongiotic dermatitis or contact, it could be contact. Pemphigus foliaceus, definitely. I've seen pemphigus foliaceus patients to present this way. And uh, I have to admit, when I see this for the first time, uh, even though it's not the most common thing, I would definitely, uh, 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 something in my mind would tell me pemphigus foliaceus. Contact derm, uh, candidiasis, uh, are, and subderm are more likely though. Um, so let's see histology for our final case. This is an exciting case. What do you see here on histology? Uh, Prego pigmentosa, I like that differential diagnosis, but um, um, uh, um, it's uh, uh, much more weepy and, uh, and uh, uh, with a lot of uh, large patch area to be um, uh, Prego pigmentosa. So we see a lot of these in the films. Someone said LCH. So yeah, so when we see a lot of ease in the film, there's always something that you should always keep in mind. So, so look at this cell. Remember, when we talk about histiocytosis and especially Langerhan cell histiocytosis, in the books, they always tell you about the Langerhan cells and the bean-shaped cells, and this is true. It does represent Langerhan cell histiocytosis. But in most biopsies I've seen, and maybe in every biopsy I've seen for Langerhan cell histiocytosis, what first strikes me in, one, uh, in the histology is the amount of eosinophils. For some reason, there's a lot of eosinophils in Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And um, when I start seeing uh, eosinophils in these conditions, it would make me actually look more to the histiocytic cells and see if they have the bean-shaped appearance of, uh, uh, of LCH. And over here, you can see lots of them. Look at them, they're all really form shape, even when they're not being shaped, you can tell that this is taken from a different cut and you're seeing it from the side. And they're all being shaped Langerhans cells. All of these cells are actually Langerhans cells. So when you go back to this image, well, one of you said uh, seborrheic dermatitis. And yeah, because Langerhans cells histiocytosis, histiocytosis is a great mimicker of seborrheic dermatitis and it likes to involve seborrheic areas. So um, uh, when you have a patient especially young patients, even though we know that LCH, especially the acute type, occurs in very young patients. When you have a young patient with severe subderm, not improving with, uh, with, uh, with the regular therapy, always uh, keep uh, an open mind regarding uh, LCH. So um, that's all what, uh, I mean, I do have a lot of slides that I wanted to show you today, but um, I think we should, uh, we can make a stop right now. It's been a long time and I don't want to, keep going on for a very long time. And in the end, we can do these slides another time. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of the cases that we, that we just saw? Feel free to ask questions. So this is the end of our meeting. Anyone, uh, if you wanna leave, it's fine. If you wanna ask questions, you can ask me here in the, in the chat box. And uh, uh, if you also want, you can send me an email for any question about any of the cases. Uh, thank you for uh, attending, and um, I'll see, we'll see you again in a future date, probably after two weeks. Thank you very much.